जय हिंद एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच डियर ऑर्गेनाइजर्स फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी ओवर हेयर एंड इट्स अ मैटर ऑफ ग्रेट ऑनर एंड प्रिवलेज दैट आई एम स्टैंडिंग हेयर एंड टॉकिंग टू यू अबाउट समथिंग दैट इज वेरी क्लोज टू माई हार्ट एंड टूडे वील स्पीक अबाउट द डायस पोरा बट बिफोर दैट दिस अ स्मॉल स्टोरी यू नो वेन नेपोलियन बिकेम द एम्पर ऑफ फ्रांस somebody asked napoleon how did you become the emperor of france he said i was riding on my horse and i saw the the crown of france lying in the dust i picked it up i placed it on my head and i became the emperor of france uh you see why did he say that we are talking about the diaspora and uh, what i'd like to say that i have never seen apart from the last 10 years when the diaspora was picked up from the ground and placed on the head as a crown and uh, the kind of interest that is there in the diaspora the kind of respect and honor that is now being given to the nris that was not seen before they had a lot of problems you go to the embassy there is a problem you go to the high commission there is a problem uh, you know today when the prime minister goes there are thousands of them waving flags they were there 10 years back also they were there 25 30 40 50 years back but we never saw that it's all a question of giving pride uh i i i was discussing today i i met with a diplomat and i had a long discussion with him and i said we are in maharashtra and this is the bhumi of uh, chhatrapati shivaji maharaj and uh, so he was asking why is he so revered and why is he so worshiped so i said not because he was the strongest king or the most powerful king or the richest king that is not why chhatrapati shivaji maharaj is worshiped he is worshiped because he gave hindus their honor back <laughs> hindus who had been under a tyrannical regime who had been persecuted for hundreds of years found a voice he told them that you matter and i think this is the biggest contribution of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj bigger than anything bigger than shaking the foundations of the mughal empire bigger than anything else today uh, when i see our nris we feel very proud and of course we have heard the stories about uh, you know them being ceos of top companies in the world and fortune 500 companies of the world and that is a matter of great pride for us and i for one don't you know i'm i'm not disturbed by brain drain i mean we have enough brains i what is the population of india it is it is more than europe africa north america and probably south america combined the total population of europe you know if you actually count the total population of europe i think more people in india right now have a stomach ache than the entire population of europe so there is there is this whole brain drain thing it it was relevant at one point in time but today i don't think it's relevant and i would like to talk about two three issues but first of all uh you know something about the mindset our mindset and i feel that our mindset needs to change this is what i feel sometimes i tend to say uh, say things that are you know away from the norm and maybe slightly even controversial but let's say something controversial so uh uh you see the thing is that uh, peace and this is what i feel and i could be wrong here peace is overrated this whole thing about we are a peaceful people we should be peaceful people there should be world peace this whole peace thing is overrated because there is no peace in this world let us recognize some basic truths you can aspire for peace you can be aspirational as far as peace is concerned but the fact of the matter is that today human beings you know charles darwin spoke about uh, you know the survival of the fittest you would have heard charles darwin's theory and what does he say why, why are humans the fittest to survive because we were intelligent not because we were faster not because we were stronger because you know an elephant is more powerful a tiger is more powerful and ferocious a panther is faster but we are on the top of the food chain because we think and because we think we are able to put 
a majestic animal like a lion or a tiger inside a cage. Because of the violence that human beings are able to commit, and most of the time it's pathetic, it's bad, it is something that must be condemned. But at the same time, we should also understand that we cannot ignore violence and live in our own world that, hey, everybody should be peaceful because people are not peaceful. And I'll come back to the diaspora in a bit, but there is no peace in this world, unfortunately. And today, uh, you know, if India is seeing peace today, after many, many decades of war, of terrorism, if today India is seeing peace, it is only because of one reason, that the world realizes that India has the ability to wage war. And we must understand that only the threat of violence can guarantee peace. Peace cannot be guaranteed by good intentions. And one more thing, and I often make this statement and many people don't like it. You see, what, what actually happens is that if you continue to be peaceful for a long time, people will think that you are harmless. There is a difference between being peaceful and being harmless. Let us not be harmless. Let us be thought about as a people who have the ability to inflict violence, but choose to be peaceful. It, it is like a lion in a good mood, you see? And when, when our enemies know and when our enemies understand, today, Pakistan is not doing anything. You see, and I keep on discussing with uh, my NRI brothers and sisters, and we all, you have these phone calls, you know, because I, I don't travel very much. And I don't travel very much because I have FIRs filed against me in UK by, by, by Pakistanis because Pakistanis think that I'm a terrorist for some, some reason, I don't know. So they said, they, in the city of Kent, they filed an FIR against me for some reason. So this is what I keep on telling NRIs also. And the reason why I'm saying all this is, uh, even in the army, we have always believed, and we have been told in the army that uh, this has, India has always been a non-expeditionary country. Right? India has always been a non-expeditionary country. We have never sent our armies abroad. You must have heard the story. You know, we have never attacked anybody. Have you heard these stories? Okay, these are fake stories, okay? Uh, th this is fake because this n entire narrative is fake. And uh, General Zoravar Singh went to Tibet. And, and the flag of the Dogra Empire flew on Tibetan territory beyond Ladakh. Maharaja Ranjit Singh conquered Kabul. And the flag of the Khalsa armies were on the fort in Kabul. You know about the Cholas? Right? And yeah, and who, who built the Angkor Wat temple? So this entire thing that Indians are very peaceful and we are very, I think this was one of the greatest marketing initiatives by Mahatma Gandhi. That, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you become peaceful, then people will not harm you and they will leave you alone. Nobody leaves you alone if you're peaceful. Right? Uh, it is important, and I, and I quote, all of you have heard this before, and uh, because this comes from, from the life and times, it is quoted, it is quoted from the life and times of Prabhu Sri Ram, and it's very important, because our ancestors have been telling us something time and again, but unfortunately, we do not understand it. And what is said is that, Bina Jaladijal, there is no friendship without fear. There is no friendship without fear. Your ability to strike terror in the heart of your enemy will, will guarantee peace and prosperity to this nation. You see, and once I said this in front of a senior politician and he, and he, and he smiled and he laughed and he said, I am not a politician. So, so, uh, so I, I, I told him that, sir, uh, when the Prime Minister of India goes anywhere, no, when he talks, whether to a friend or an enemy, any head of state, when the Prime Minister of India goes somewhere, right, the other person, the other head of state, enemy or friend, doesn't matter, 
he must know that somewhere behind, in the depths of the ocean, there is INS Arihant, there is INS Vikrant. They must know that. Now, where are the NRIs in this entire conversation? We are talking about the diaspora. The reason why I gave you these examples was that you would understand that today, while the NRIs are our ambassadors, they're not simply NRIs, they're our ambassadors. They're a source of great pride and motivation for all of us. We feel happy when we talk about Sundar Pichai, you know? And everybody feels that, hey, here is a role model and this is one guy I can emulate. But today, unfortunately, a lot of our NRIs, unfortunately, they're under threat. This is true. They are under threat. They are under threat in Canada. They are under threat in UK. To some extent, in the US, they are under threat. They are under threat from Pakistanis. They are under threat from Khalistanis. In fact, uh, you must have heard about the threat of Gurpatan Singh Pannu. He said all the Hindus get out of Canada. Many people took it lightly because every Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, Gurpatan Singh Pannu makes a threat for some reason. This man will just say, I'll blow up the international airport or Air India, whatever he says. But the fact of the matter is, there are enough crazy elements, enough crazy elements who may want to carry out that threat. There have been cases of stabbings and knifing and killings of NRIs in hate crimes. And it's only a matter of time, I'm telling you, it's only a matter of time before, and I hope it does not happen because, you know, my family members also live abroad, many of them, my, my elder sister is, my real sister, she has been living in New York for almost 25, 30 years now. And, uh, but the thing is that, you see, our NRIs have today, maybe, maybe, and I could be wrong here, but they have realized that just by being successful, just by paying your taxes, and just by being good model citizens, it does not mean that your safety and security is guaranteed. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry can come here and attack on the road. So in the US, they say that Indians are the highest earners in terms of you know, per capita. And the prison population is the lowest as far as Indians are concerned. And so many senators and congressmen have said that, you know, I have Indian voters, and they are model citizens. They are model immigrants. They will follow the law. They will follow the law. They will pay their taxes. And uh, one gentleman also said some time back, uh, that Indians pay, I think, X times more tax than the normal guy. So that is one thing. But such people need to be protected. Such people need to be protected because, you see, there is a resilience. Please understand what I'm trying to say. And uh, if I've said anything wrong, I would love for you to stand up and correct me. We have almost lived under foreign rule for 1,000 years. This country is still 85% Hindu. You can't say the same about Iran, you can't say the same about Egypt, about Europe, about any other country in the world except India. But that is only true because this is India. But when you uproot a person from India, the sustenance that he derives from this culture, this spiritual land, it has to be created in some other land, and they are very successful at creating it. But that shield of protection goes away. Today, I get a call from many NRIs. Uh, so many Sikhs, so many Sikhs call me, my brothers and sisters, and they say that, uh, you know, we want to raise our voice against the Khalistanis, but we are terrified because these people are crazy. They'll, they'll, they'll do something stupid. They say that Pakistanis are extremely violent in the UK, and they've made ghettos where people can't enter, we can't enter, white people cannot under, uh, enter into that. There are, there are Sharia zones in the UK, and this is a real problem. What they have done is that they have taken advantage of a certain mindset, including white guilt, in these foreign countries. What has happened is that Europe was a major colonial power. You know, the Dutch, the British, the French, the Portuguese, etc., etc. And these were major colonial powers. And after the Second World War, there was a thinking that, you know, 
that you know we have shed too much blood the first world war the second world war colonialism slavery and slowly and slowly these countries started getting free from the european yoke including india 15th august 1947 and then there was over a period of time maybe a realization this is my guess i can only guess that there was a realization that hey you know what is happening is that uh, maybe what we did was wrong what our forefathers did was wrong though they, they don't teach colonialism as much as they should in british schools but the fact of the matter is that it you know that mindset exists that you know maybe there was a joke i was reading yesterday i was reading a joke so british guy tells the indian that this is the british museum and the indian guy says oh yeah in the, in india we call it chor bazar <laughs> so uh, i i read this joke yesterday it was forwarded on whatsapp so all the wealth stolen and kept there and uh, so what i'm trying to say is that uh, uh, our nris were there over a period of time they have managed to be away from india yet establish themselves there they made their temples uh, they have ensured that they celebrate all festivals they do everything there they have they carry india in their hearts but the problem is that today they are under threat and our nris need to be pre i wish i could go the problem is that i cannot go to uk for obvious reasons otherwise i would have taken the first flight gone to uk and actually sat with the indians and tell them that you know don't worry we are there with you and you know somebody to tell them that and find a few aggressive guys there you know because sometimes street power works how can somebody gather 500 people surround our high commission and take down our flag i mean i cried that day it felt so humiliating and i promised myself that i will not forget and i will not forgive and neither must you and when i spoke to my nris brothers and sisters they said that these things are deliberately done to put us down it is financed by pakistan it is financed by china and these are optics so what i'm calling for here is strength what i'm calling for here is for india to be known as a military power nobody does that with the chinese flag i'm sorry i'm saying this nobody does that with the chinese flag let me tell you a small story about a russian diplomat a russian diplomat posted around lebanon or some other place in the middle east this guy was kidnapped by terrorists and this is a true story and the terrorist actually called up the russian embassy and they told the russian embassy that you have 24 hours these are our demands these are the people that you must set free the russians that captured a few people a few terrorists you must leave these terrorists otherwise we will kill your diplomats the leader of the terrorists you know he had made this demand on a phone call to the russian embassy within 5 6 hours or by the evening he got a packet the terrorist leader he got a packet he opened the packet and inside was a human hand there was a hand cut off from the elbow so he didn't know whose hand it was and then he saw the rings it was his father's hand and there was a note written in arabic that if you do not set free our diplomats within the next 2 hours we'll send other body parts of your father this terrorist was so terrified he said that these people are crazy they dropped him off to the russian embassy today do you know one thing i'm i'm telling you this because let's live in the real world there is violence in the world and i'm sorry if my examples are i apologize if my examples are graphic but this is the real world this is how it functions uh ships have been attacked you're aware red sea uh, along that entire corridor you know ships have been attacked british ships have been attacked american ships have been attacked 
Every ship has been attacked. Have you ever heard of a Chinese ship being attacked? Because no, Indian ships are not attacked because India has put 20 warships there. <laughs> this, is, this was my point, that India has put so much of fire, they put marine commandos there. Trust me, you don't want to argue with a marine commando. <laughs> and uh, they've put so much of firepower there, but have you ever seen a Chinese ship attack there? And Chinese presence is very less there. You know why the Chinese ships are not attacked? Because China funds Iran, and Iran funds these terror groups. You don't go against your own sponsors, right? So that is what is happening there. So our NRIs need to be protected. They are our geopolitical assets. And the way I look at NRIs, I look at them through the prism of geopolitics and national security. I don't know in the current generation of NRIs who would be the next Rishi Sunak or the next Vivek Ramaswamy. And therefore, I come to my main point. It is important for the NRIs to seek political power in the countries of their residents today. And it is important that we support them. Whether at a government level, it doesn't matter because America allows for these things. It's legal in America. You can find ways. I'm not saying foreign entities. I'm not talking about foreign entities. But within America, you can certainly support. Ind Indians pay, uh, in Indians contribute to their political parties, and Americans can contribute to their political parties. But the fact of the matter is, the more Indians are in politics today, you know why the Khalistanis are so strong? The Khalistanis are so strong because they support the government of Justin Trudeau. They have a stake in the government. And that makes them powerful. Jagmeet Singh is the guy. He's a dyed-in-the-wool Khalistani, hardcore Khalistani. He, he's a politician, but if he was not a politician, he would have been a terrorist. And this guy supports Justin Trudeau, and he supports Justin Trudeau, and Justin Trudeau turns a blind eye. His father was the prime minister, and his father turned a blind eye to the Kanishka bombings. I don't know if you're aware, but his father turned a blind eye to the Kanishka bombings. And that guy, Panwar, the terrorist, Panwar, there were weapons and explosives found at his house by the Canadian Mounties, and he was let off. They say Canada is a free country. Apparently, it is so free that you can do anything. You're free to explode bombs. You're free to, and that, and that, uh, and that entire thing about, uh, you know, they, they took out this junkie of Mrs. Gandhi's assassination, right? All these things are happening. Have you ever thought about how they might terrify a non-resident Indian in Canada? When a terrorist openly makes a threat that Hindus get out, do you understand how, how uh, disturbing it's, it must be for them? This is what I'm saying, that unless NRIs seek actively, actively seek political power, I have a few other suggestions which I will not give here because you might think that it's absolutely overboard. But I've said it in the past for our high commissions. I don't know if you've watched my videos, but I've said it in the past. You must have a local security agency guarding your high commissions. You must have a local security agency guarding your embassies. You know, in every US embassy across the world, there are US Marines. Do you know that? There are US Marines guarding. If you try to enter a US embassy by force, he will shoot you. How can somebody take down my flag here? I haven't understood this. If I had any power, and thank God for a beautiful country that I don't, because it, was, it would have gone sideways, absolutely. but. Uh, if I had any power, I would put armed people there in front of our high commissions, front of our councils, in front of our embassies, armed people with guns. I would put soldiers of the Indian Army there. Because why? That is sovereign Indian land. The embassy in Washington is not American soil, it's Indian soil. And Indian soil must be guarded and protected. 
and I, and I will and I will just make the statement that uh, a lot of people talk about the Constitution of India, and all of us love our Constitution. We respect our Constitution. But there is somebody defending that Constitution, right? Somebody is defending that Constitution. And I speak as a soldier because that is what I am and that is the language that I speak and the language I understand also. A lot of people uh, want me to talk about peace. And then I tell them that I was in the Indian Army and I have got nothing to do with peace. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, what do you do? You know what is taught in the Indian Army? I'll tell you. At various levels, different things are taught. Uh, so, so, at various levels, so a general will speak at a certain level, of course, with a great level of maturity. With a great level of maturity, foresight, he'll talk about strategy, he'll talk about, you know, the geopolitical situation and all that. But in the end, in the end, and let me put it as bluntly as I can, as simply as I can, and many people, even in the army, will disagree with me. But this is a fact. What does the Indian Army do? The Indian Army, of course, it guards the nation, and of course, it does all of that. There is no doubt. But when we go to war, what are we doing? So the Indian Army exists to kill the enemies of the state. That is what we do. You can paint it in white, and you can make it nice and uh, easy to consume. But what I'm telling you is the truth. War is an ugly business, right? You agree? But somebody has to do it. You agree? Yes. Yeah, we do that. We do that, and it is an ugly business, and there is no getting around this. Similarly, this war is being fought against our NRIs today. Our NRIs are being threatened by various elements who are inimical to India. And our NRIs should and must be protected at all costs. Because if you don't protect our NRIs, A, we would be doing them great disservice. That is number one. And number two, we would have lost our greatest asset abroad. We don't have one ambassador in the United States. We have a million ambassadors in the United States. We don't have one high commissioner in the UK. We have hundreds and thousands of them. Each one of them qualified, each one of them educated, each one of them loyal, each one of them brave, and each one of them speaking out for Bharatma. The final uh, thing that I want to say, and I'll wrap up and then, uh, you know, we'll take your questions, uh, along with uh, Somitraji is here, and we'll jointly take your questions. I just wanted to tell you that uh, we must change the narrative somehow. I go and I talk about this as often as I can. I, I talk about this as often as I can, and even if I manage to change the mindset of one person, my coming to Mumbai will be a big victory for me personally. Please, and this is my request to you, please uh, get rid of this belief that we were a peaceful country. Please get rid of this belief that we are a peaceful people. All your gods and goddesses carry weapons. Have you noticed? So, we are not peaceful. <laughs> Our Puranas are full of stories of war. One of India's greatest sons, one of India's greatest sons, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was a warrior. Prabhu Shri Ram was a warrior. Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj was a warrior. All your heroes are warriors. Almost all of them. They have fought. And this is what it is. In my office, and all of you are welcome to visit my office. It's in Noida. On the main wall in the newsroom, in black acrylic font, it is written, Dharmo Rakshati Rakshata. Dharma protects those who protect Dharma. 
जय हिंद भारत माता की जय